Oh, was it not? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's on now. We've had a good warm up. We've oh, we've just we've just produced some pure gold dust. Well, we've had a warm up. So yeah. Sally and I are having an interview where we're talking around mental health and well-being and health and happiness and positive and negative sides of everything. Uh, we've just had a, a warm up where I forgot to record the first half of our interview. So <laughs> so we're, we're, we're starting with a bit of a warm up. So we're going to uh, go through it again now. So all of that gold that we've just created, we have to recreate now. So intro to myself, we have to think what have I said and what have I, what have I not said. So uh, my name's Mike. I run Better Happy with uh, my business partner, Neil, and we work on helping people live healthier and happier lives. And I met the wonderful Sally over here in a networking meeting. And Sally's got a really great, inspiring story and she does wonderful things. So I thought it would be very worthwhile to, for us to have a chat, for me to interview Sally and to provide any individuals or organizations that are listening with some really useful insights and content into how you can think about mental health and well-being, how you can better approach it in the workplace and how you can better approach it with yourself. So let's start with Sally. Sally's just going to introduce herself for the second time and uh, tell us a little bit about herself. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, yes, I'm Sally Desbra and I'm a mental health first aid training instructor. So I run my own business working with organisations and individuals to empower people with the skills, knowledge and confidence to be able to support others who might be experiencing some kind of emotional distress or mental health issue. And some of the key takeaways are also about maximizing your own mental wellness as well. So yes, we're learning kind of the key skills around potentially identifying an issue in somebody else, you know, being able to respond appropriately, support and signpost, but also thinking about all the, the key mechanisms for keeping our, ourselves in a, a mentally well place as well. Um, that's the, kind of my key focus is, is really providing and raising that awareness in our communities. Um, so really, really, really relevant, really relevant skills. And I'm sure that most people listening will have an interest into what you do because of how relevant it is to all of us to want to be able to look after ourselves and maintain our, our, our mental health. So I thought a good outline for today is what we'll do is we'll just start off by just having a bit of a summary and a look into mental health and what, what we, what we mean by that, what's kind of going on with it, what, Where's our country at in regards to, well, and our world in regards to mental health and how things are changing? Then, because it's always interesting to hear a story, let's let's dive into your story and find out how you ended up where you are, um, doing what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting story. And what and something I already mentioned is that it's really interesting that neither of us have ended up where we are doing what we do with the passion that we've got through a clinical setting. It's both through our own personal experience, which I think makes it more interesting and more relevant. So. We'll do that, dive into your story, and then just provide some like really useful insights to people that they can action on, um, whether that's in the workplace or with themselves, to actually start thinking about things more proactively potentially, and know and have just have some useful action to um, advice to action. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start off with then, and just have a little dive into mental health and what we what we mean by that and where it's at. And the first thing I wanted to ask was, do you think that? negative mental health so mental health issues i don't know if negative is the right word to use me mental health issues are increasing or decreasing where do you think we're at with with mental health i think that mental health issues are probably increasing particularly given the events of this year but we also know that people are more willing to talk about it so it could be a mix of the two things there's definitely more awareness and more kind of rhetoric and discussion around mental health and mental health issues uh, particularly with the events of this year, there's been so much significant change and uncertainty, which has really been intensified um, over the course of 2020 for everybody globally, really. And whilst we yeah. all kind of live through common uncertainty and change, like I said, that's really intensified this year and there's been so much unknown. And yeah, people have been worried about jobs and money and relationships and family and living alone and you know, being frontline staff and, and all those kind of things. Um, so I think with that comes that fear and, and anxiety and worry. And actually fear and worry and anxiety in response to this year's event is quite normal. I think it's absolutely natural to be worried about it. But there 
are more significant impacts where it's starting to impact people's day to day. And there's all sorts of research that's been conducted over the course of this year that really tells us that people are struggling with their mental health. Um, and, you know, we mentioned it on the, the pre-conversation. On the, the warm-up. <laughs> some of these statistics, so some research by the Office of National Statistics um, found that for the period um, July 19 to March 2020, depression rates were around 9.7%. And in June 2020, that had almost doubled to 19.2%. And a lot of those respondents were people who had been previously well, so hadn't experienced any kind of mental health issues in the past. So, so no July 19 is, is pre-COVID. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting question. So obviously a lot of a lot of COVID's pre presented the world and the people within it with a variety of different problems. Um, and potentially, I'm sure, very sure, leading to concerns that weren't there before, which has decreased the quality of mental health. But what about, do we think that mental health is such an issue because of COVID or has it been an ongoing thing before the COVID situation? I think mental health and mental health issues have always been a problem, but I do think it feels to me, certainly from, from what I see in different posts and I look on LinkedIn, the shift in people's openness openness and talking about what's going on for them. Yep. Because of the impacts of this year, it almost feels like it's safe to say, actually, I'm not okay. Yeah. Because it's fine not to be okay in, in this kind of in these circumstances. Yep. But I think mental health issues have always been there, always been around. I think it's just it's not being discussed. So, you know, you hear conversations, oh, it's kind of, well, not necessarily fashion, but, you know, people, people can't cope. I don't know why they can't cope. Well, actually, I think people's willingness to talk about it, people couldn't cope maybe 50 years ago. It's just yep. the conversation wasn't there. Yeah, and that's something that we shared previously that for, for myself, my experience starting off in the military, you know, ten, when, when I joined the military, I can't remember how long ago, but it was around like seven, kind of 10, year, 10 years ago you get all this training to prepare you for what, what, what you're going to go through, which is obviously going to be some pretty intense stuff. Um, but you don't talk about, we didn't talk about mental health. You know, it wasn't really something that was discussed, but throughout our lifetimes, that's something that's really changed. And I remember when I started the military, if somebody said to me, mental health, I wouldn't have really meant, no, genuinely wouldn't have even known what that term meant. Mm. Um, whereas now it's something that we all know what it means. So we all have some, awareness of it and there's very few people that wouldn't have heard the term so it's definitely something that we're becoming more aware of and more open to talking about um, as time goes on yeah and I think that the more people are aware and finding out about mental health and, and different issues um, the more open people will be to talking about it and, and we had a discussion before that the recording bit that you know quite often when we talk about mental health there's a negative connotation associated yeah, definitely with it. actually people are jumping to mental illness rather than yeah. mental health as concepts like we all have physical health yeah and i suppose you can think of it as a as a scale so physical health we know that we've got one end of the scale where we're in good physical health then we've got the middle where we're not really good or bad you know we're just kind of average and then we've got down here which is where we're you know we're, we're in pain we're overweight we're whatever it might be so we've got good physical health kind of not not really anything and then bad physical health and i think the same is true for mental health we need to be aware that it's just as important to focus on positive mental health and developing it to be a good thing mm -hmm. as it is to just address it when it's a bad thing. Yeah. And I think that so often happens is actually we start thinking about it when stuff goes wrong and we take it for granted and actually we can be proactive in looking after our mental health. So we stay at that positive end yeah. rather than finding it, seeing that decline and, and ending up in a poor mental health. I've, I read a really interesting statistic about the, um, the, pres the prescription of antidepressants and how it's like doubled, 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 doubled since about seven years ago. And that is like, you've just said, that's a very reactive, um, and obviously some people genuinely need, um, antidepressants for, for genetic for genetic reasons but that a lot of the time is a quick reactive response to a problem and it's the same with with physical health where if we let it get to a point where it's really bad then we're going to try and find quick fixes and maybe not long-term solutions whereas actually if we think about it as a positive thing as well mm -hmm. we can really offset a lot of that 
Yeah, absolutely. Prevention is better than cure. Hundred, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. How how many of us go through schooling being taught about mental health and how to proactively look after it and coping skills? Yep. So through my through my schooling, it was maybe touched on when I was in my A levels, when I was doing PE for A level, and it was just a brief what is mental health, and and that was it. There was no no kind of in depth stuff around it at all. But you know we're taught about nutrition and we're taught about physical activity and we're taught about you know being overweight and, and obese and you know all the impacts that that can have yep. quite a lot yeah um so there's definitely a disparity between those two things even though they're very intrinsically linked and just as important as one another yeah and that's mad isn't it because if you if, when we consider that actually all any of us want and this might sound uh, idealistic but it's true that all any of us want is to be happy and you know we've all got our own ways of, of going about that it's absolutely crazy that we're not taught that in school or taught to think about that there's a really famous John Lennon quote uh, I'm, I can't 100% guarantee that he said it because a lot of quotes get, people say that he didn't say it but when, when he was at school a teacher asked him what he wanted to be and he said happy and the teacher responded you haven't understood the question and then he responded you don't understand life or, you haven't understood life and I that really strikes a chord with me because I think that highlights a lot of our issues a lot of our problems in our society that we were so trained to work to go into this certain lifestyle um, but what we're not trained is to how to enjoy is how to enjoy that and actually how to make sure it's appropriate for us and how to deal with difficulties and like I said all we want is to be happy so surely it's one of the most important things to teach yeah absolutely and it comes from within right so many people look for happiness. Oh, it's the next thing. Yeah. It's the next job. It's the next house. It's the, the next car. Actually, happiness comes from within. So, you know, simple things like just valuing yourself and having an optimistic view of things can be so helpful in practicing gratitude. Yeah. You know, we can be more happy for that. And even if you're the most well-paid, skilled, intelligent person in the world, if you're not able to do that, you're not ever going to be happy. If you're not able to value yourself and have these basic skills around mental health which is what which is what i definitely think we should get onto like what are the, the the basic the basic skills to to be healthy and to be happy so let's jump onto your story then sally so like i said we you've come you haven't come to this necessarily for the clinical development you haven't like decided like this is what i want to do from a very young age you've had a direct experience and then had a passion kind of ignited within you to to focus on this because you know it's a problem that needs to be addressed so so what what how did you start off your journey towards wanting to know more about mental health yes yeah, so I, I guess two places where my kind of interest in mental health really stems from so my working background's in HR and I started working in HR in 2008 and I suppose over the course of my 11 12 year career noticing the number of mental health issues that people are experiencing in organizations and having day-to-day -day conversations almost with people experiencing that difficulty coaching line managers through that as well and again you know for a lot of line managers there was fear again that oh they've mentioned mental health i can't say anything at all well you can but we so often treat physical and mental health very differently um so that was kind of where my interest really first stemmed and when i think back to you know one of the last organizations i, I worked at you know probably about half of the the, the health cases that the HR team were dealing with related to kind of some mental health issue. That's crazy. Yeah. So it was the impact and the prevalence was really kind of obvious. Um, and that's, my, you know, sorry to interrupt, but that's how much, how much of an impact is it having, you know, looking at it from purely from a business perspective and, you know, how much of an impact is it having on our economy and, and organizations if 50% of all problems that the HR staff have, are dealing with and trying to support their staff with is, is, is mental health. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's huge. It is huge. Um, so some research done by the NHS in 2016 suggested that uh, mental Ill health costs 105.2 billion pounds um, across the economy, across the costs and treatment. And most and of the time that's because it's become an issue because we haven't been proactive with it. Yeah. Um, but about half of that 105.2 billion pounds sits with the family, sits with the individual experiencing the mental health issue and yeah. their families in lost income, in lower educational attainment and all of those kind of things. Yeah. And then the, you know, the impacts on the economy as well. So where people aren't able to work because of their mental health issues, it impacts the economy, doesn't it? So, 
yeah, it's it's huge. And that was just in England, 105.2 billion pounds in England. So you so you were having a direct. You're in HR, so you've obviously got a natural uh, desire to want to work with people, and then yeah. you're noticing that all you know it's an ongoing thing over a period of 12 years. But then even with this awareness, you still come to your own issues. Yeah. So I've I've had my experience of mental illness. So. Back in 2016, I was diagnosed with severe depression with symptoms of anxiety. And I suppose it was a, a couple of years of stuff that happened in the lead up to, to that diagnosis. So I experienced you know, relationship breakdown, which was quite significant. Yep. And you know, um, I really think that had I talked and shared my feelings, I probably wouldn't ended, have ended up where I did. Um, but I wasn't a natural talker. I was always concerned about other people and feeling like I was burdening other people, um, which is an issue that a lot of people deal with. Um, so I had that and dealing with the emotions of everyone around me, you know, family and friends. And, you know, it's just very difficult, um, you know, moving, moving back home in, in with my mum. So, you know, at the age of 27 you don't really want to be doing that and as grateful as I was at the time it's kind of like you feel like you're going you're going a little bit backwards and for anyone who's moved out of home and had to go back again even if it's for two months six months if you've been out out of the family home for 10 years it's you know it's quite difficult to go back to that place you yeah. know you've got to this is you know these I'm are sure my if it, I'm sure yeah. if there's somebody that's been for that situation they're like yep <laughs> yeah and then um I suppose on top of that uh, I my the role I was in I absolutely loved the culture was amazing the team was fantastic um, but the role was absolutely huge and at the busiest time of year my assistant left the organization as well so I was just working silly hours over the winter as well so you know not really seeing daylight and um, for a good four or five months just working 60 70 hour weeks and I just really kind of almost burnt out I suppose and actually I took a nosedive when everything leveled out yeah so when I'd found my new flat I was in a new loving relationship I had a new assistant at work and we were training him up and he was absolutely fantastic and that is when I went and, and that's such a that's such an interesting insight that people need to understand. So you you pretty much worked yourself into the ground physically and mentally with, at your job, yeah, for a long time, yeah. But you've but you've managed it, and then as soon as things have leveled out, you've crashed and burned. Yeah. And that's, that's you know correct. that's that's the way the human body works. It will it will it it, it responds to stress and it will you know we're, we're very strong. We've got a very strong survival instinct. So. I speak to a lot of people that are, you, you know, how much you sleeping and they're like three hours a night and how much you work in and like, okay. And what are you eat in takeouts? And I'm like, okay, and how long have you been in this for? And they're like four years. And I'm like, and okay. Do you, and how do you feel? And they're like, I'm okay. And I'm like, okay. Because they don't realize that they, they think they're superhumans, but they don't realize that what they're doing is lining themselves up for a big. Yeah. Yeah. And there will come a point where the body says no more. And, and the mind says no more. Why were you so, when you were working those hours, were you essentially sacrificing your well-being for your job? Were you conscious of that? Were you conscious that you were not, that what you was doing was unhealthy or did you, were you just, oh, it's all right? Just focus. I mean, I loved the job and I felt like I had to deliver. It, I think it was the conscientiousness in me that was like, you know, I'm going to do a really good job and I'll get really great feedback and I'm going to deliver and, and all those kind of things. And then, you know, as time went on, you know, I'd be working on a Saturday morning and my other half would be messaging me saying, you know, what time are you coming over? We're meant to be getting together today. And, you know, I forgot our anniversary. And then, you know, all these emotions started coming up. Oh, I'm a rubbish girlfriend. And all this stuff started happening as well. So I really yeah. started to notice the impact. And I, I was just, oh, goodness me. But all of that stemmed from the, the like, feeling like you're a rubbish girlfriend and, like, getting stressed. All of that seemed to have stemmed from your main driver which was to be good at your job and provide yeah how old were you how old were you during this point this kind of phase sally so that was so i was diagnosed with uh depression shortly before my 30th birthday so i was 29 but the period of work that led up to that was your late 20s yeah late 20s and i wonder you know and this is something that 
for, so for myself, this is something that I broke out of in my around the age of 25. I was giving myself to my job, but I, and I also had this. I was driven by this desire, desire, yeah, desire, I suppose, and this need to to fit in, to to be successful, to 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 do what I thought was the right thing. And for me, that was a job I didn't even like. But it, it's just an interesting insight into do people in their twenties if they haven't been educated in the right way in regards to a peer, are they, will they willingly sa- sacrifice their own health because it sits below being good at your job and succeeding, which is something that's drilled into us at school. And I think that's a it's, a... it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because I, I was so engaged and so loved my role that I was just completely invested in it. And I suppose as a, from an employer, uh, from an employer's perspective, you would want that. You'd be like, this person is super driven. They're like, they're, they're going to work overtime if I need them to. They're, they're, they'll, they'll answer the phone whenever I call them, you know, and they're going to get things done. Yeah. So that's attractive. Yeah. But ultimately yeah. what happens is that person, it, it's, the long, it's that long-term thinking. And this is the same for us as individuals. It might feel good in the short term, maybe even five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, but that person's not going to last. No. And I read in one of Deloitte's report, reports that burnout is a huge issue for people in highly stressful jobs and the people who are really passionate and are always putting in 110 percent. That's where you might start to see those issues. Yeah. Um, driven people. Yeah. And driven people and, and burnout, certainly. So that's, you know, that's something that I think individuals and organizations and employers need to really like be conscious of. And I'm sure they are because of the, the levels of burnout that are happening now that if you're letting your or encouraging your staff to put work above everything else, especially mm. themselves and their health and their relationships and their social life. Mm. There's going to be a, there's going to, you're going to be putting a significant stop on how long that person's going to be with you. Yeah. And I've read a lot of things about companies now struggling to have long-term staff. You know, it's this high turnover and it's those long-term staff that really change, change organizations. The people that have been there, for, you know, it from the start, they remember when it went through COVID, you know, they, they've seen it change and, by letting your people work too hard, you, you kind of sacrifice in that short-term gain for long-term loss. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. So um, I think that's something that employers need to be mindful of. And, you know, when you are working that much and you are working that hard, you know, the things like taking a, taking a break, just stopping. Um, I would literally be planted at my desk all day and people would be bringing my tea because I just wouldn't move. So yeah. I, I wouldn't be getting up from my desk to go to the loo it's almost, without going to the loo it's just like your it's like your passion and this is something you know i talk to a lot of um self-employed people and it's something that it's like it's something that's so common and i mean myself that if you're passionate you you have to be careful otherwise you'll burn yourself out because passionate people will willingly or subconsciously sacrifice their, their self to achieve their goals but obviously from what we've just talked about that won't work yeah and I think self-awareness is so important in all of that. If you know you're a passionate person, then right, I need to set a reminder to take a, a five minute break every hour and make sure, sure I take 45 minutes for lunch because otherwise you just don't. You just work and work and work. Okay, so this ultimately left, let, so you diagnosed depression, um, yeah. severe anxiety. So then what happened with your career then? So my line manager was fantastically amazing so supportive had some had a couple of really good conversations where i started to open up so it's quite interesting because my family noticed a change in me and i remember a conversation you know sally i'm really worried about you you don't sound your usual self and i was just i'm fine i'm just working too hard and i'm just really really tired and actually it's one of my close colleagues at work you know our team leader we had a conference call across the team because we were a regional team so we had conference calls every two weeks and she kept me on the line afterwards and she said, Sally, what's going on? You don't sound your usual self. And so she could just tell from my voice, you know, there was no picture, nothing like that. It was just over a conference call and the floodgates opened and that was it. And she said, I think you need to talk to our line manager. So I did do that. And then a couple of weeks went by um, where, I, you know, I kind of felt better for sharing everything. But then after a couple of days, I was just, you know, back in that low mood and not in a good place. And my line manager said to me, Sally, I think it might be worth going to the GP, talking about how you're feeling. You know, if you get signed off, that's absolutely no problem at all. Just do what you need to do to, to help yourself feel better. And, uh, and that's what happened. I got signed off 
And over the course of a few months, um, I was only signed off for two weeks. I'd probably return to work too quickly, to be fair, because of the guilt of being off work and letting people down and all that kind of stuff that went with it. But I returned to work, um, refused to take medication initially. And after a couple of weeks, I really felt like I needed that short term kind of boost because I, I was really in a bad place. So I started medication that was increased a couple of times, but not only that, I was thinking about my exercise, my nutrition, making sure I took regular breaks, taking lunch break and actually eating. So again, I just stopped eating and things like yeah. that. Um, and so over the course of a few months, just making all these lifestyle changes as well. And um, I kind of decided I couldn't do another winter in that job. So even though I had an amazing assistant, I just thought it, it won't be good for me. Yep. I don't want to land where I was. So I decided to move on from that organization. So as much as I love that role, as fantastic as it was as a training ground and, and culturally just a wonderful place to work, I, I kind of just thought, no, I can't, I can't put myself through another winter like that. I think that's so important what you just said there as well to understand that you've got this, you know, you've got this, this girl, this, this young driven, passionate girl and she's, and she, and she's, developed a problem but it's not because she's been treated badly it's because she's treated herself badly like she loved where she was working she was passionate about what she did so from an employee employer perspective you know nothing's going wrong and girl loves what she's doing she's driven she's passionate but actually it's that's the person that's high risk for for burning out and, and developing severe mental health issues yeah absolutely and so i so i moved on to another organization was very open about my experience of mental illness and they as an organisation were keen to do more to raise awareness and um, I was essentially approached by them and sponsored by them to become a mental health first aid instructor to deliver courses internally at the workplace and really you know through my journey of recovery I, I noticed how quiet the air was around talking about mental health issues yep. even though it's only four years ago yep. I really felt unsafe in sharing my vulnerabilities and I, I remember the first day I went back to work bumped into a senior manager in my client group or associate director and his question to me first of all was are you fixed now and I was just inside I will never forget it it hurt so so much and I just thought tip 101 how not to address yeah and I I didn't know if he was aware I was off with mental health issues I I don't know just people were told I was out of the business and but it really hurt and yeah. I kind of thought even if you're trying to be funny, it's not a funny thing to say. And, and that's when I kind of thought about need to do more to raise awareness, people's understanding, what to say, what not to say, and just generally educate people so that they do feel safe to talk about things without any kind of judgment or, or silly comments. I, I, I think it's so something that people have to think about. Everybody has to think about is that anybody can, be in a situation that arises that, that leads them to having a mental health issue all right and like for you for, for example and a lot of people will think it's people that are lazy and negative and whatever it might be you know there'll be a stigma attached to it but but that's not the case and it's this it's the situations we put ourselves in it's incorrect thinking patterns whatever it might be but anybody can put themselves in that into that position and you're a prime example of that you know high level hr professional driven working very hard which has led to you being in this position mm. but then what people have to understand is that anybody that can be there and that if you haven't experienced it yourself, you can't, you can't put, you can't put prejudice on that. You can't talk to somebody and just talk, talk about it. Like it's a, yeah. such a trivial thing because it, it's hurtful and you need to understand that if you haven't experienced it yourself, you could. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, it's a horrible place to be. Yeah. And I, I kind of do think if I'd had a, you know a, a knee operation for, for something and I came back to work after two weeks would someone say are you fixed now yeah I don't think they would just because you can't see it uh, yeah it's yeah interesting interesting so how long did you stay in that role um so so that was before so that was immediately after I returned to work so it was a few months so he yeah I, I guess he wasn't aware <laughs> and, and you know yeah, and there were other conversations as well, like you should only take antidepressants when it's really serious, you know. Well, thanks for that. That's that's very helpful. Um, cheers. Uh, so, so all those kind of conversations. So that's when I kind of realised we need to do more to raise awareness. And it was my own personal experience that I was trying to work out what to do and how to do it and how 
you know, it's, it's only little old me, how can I, you know, really make that difference? So it almost felt like the stars aligned at this new organisation when I had been so opened and they approached me and said, we want to raise awareness in this organisation. So I jumped at the chance and, you know, was certainly in the right place at the right time. And then from there, yeah, I was delivering those courses internally on the side of my full-time HR role. I was getting approached externally by other organisations who wanted to do similar things. So I started using holiday to deliver courses, but was, of course, mindful of actually taking time as well for myself. And my burning, out, do, do, burning out doing your mental health first aid courses. Yeah, doing the stuff I'm passionate about. And, uh, <laughs> and then I decided to leave the corporate HR world at the end of last year. So from the 1st of January this year, I've kind of uh, tried to go full steam ahead with raising awareness, de developing my own bespoke programmes, as well as delivering the Mental Health First Aid England products too. So, so it's clearly something you're very passionate about and believe in yeah. oh definitely and i i've just completed the youth course as well so that's something i'm really excited about you know starting to work maybe with educational establishments and, and schools um who work directly with eight to 18 year olds because yep. it, it, a lot of mental health issues start under the age of 18 so if we can provide that support and early intervention earlier on then it's less likely to impact people over the longer term yep. as well start developing coping skills and things like that so something that I'd be, so I think we need to get into some like useful advice for people now and just start giving out some, some tips and some guidance and some thoughts on it. But a question I wanted to ask was, do you, was something that interests me because of the way that I think, do you think that having a mental health issue is a negative mental health issue is pre-wired within you and going to happen because of your genetics or a lot of the time, is it because of the situation you're putting yourself into or that you're not putting yourself into but you have no choice but you've been brought up in for example mm -hmm. okay so this question is great and we always talk about the, the nature nurture argument on, on our training courses and there's no clear answer i think most of it's environmental okay most of it is environmental but there is some research that suggests that there is some genetic factors and particularly with more more serious mental health issues like schizophrenia yep. you know there's, there's some research that says if a if a twin has schizophrenia yep. it's likely that the other twin will have schizophrenia yeah um but it's it's a mix of you know genetics brain chemistry yep. stressors environmental factors the whole thing and i know i've read a bit about like you know we've we, people have different levels of dopamine that's why some people are just generally a little bit more happy-go-lucky and some people are a little bit less that way but I think Jim Carrey's got a really famous quote on it but if you don't look after yourself and put yourself in a good situation and, and surround yourself by positive people then you're, you're not really giving yourself the best chance anyway regardless of whether you've got the the better genetics or the yeah. potentially not so good ones yeah totally you know someone could have the genetics but their environment is such that actually they never experience a mental health issue yeah and you someone who doesn't have the genetics but actually their environment they might experience all sorts of trauma and this yep. and the other maybe... this is my this is my personal belief from from years of research that definitely people are more some people are more predisposed to or have the genetics that are going to make them more susceptible to having negative issues but historically they've been nowhere near as significant as they are now because the environment actually is always supported mainly supported positive health for us to survive. Whereas now we've got this completely new environment, which we've made as comfortable as possible, which is, which is great. And it gives us all this opportunity and freedom, but this environment is also a breeding ground for poor mental health. Think about like we've just talked about with yourself working too hard. If we were a hunter gatherer, you wouldn't have been able to do that. You would have been in a community of people. You would have worked till you were tired and you would have looked after each other and you, and, and you wouldn't have had the mental stresses that you did. Yeah. People comparing themselves to other people, you know it started with the radio back in the 19 early 1900s and then it was tv and then it now it's every second of the day on your phone you're looking at people that are only posting how amazing life is when perhaps it's not but you the standards have gone up and social interactions gone down and all the pre all the the essential ingredients to be healthy and keep a, men, a, a good mental and physical mental health seem to be getting worse in my opinion unless you do unless you actively do something about it which is why we need education and intervention yeah I 100% agree with that. So what, so what are there some of the top kind of guidance points that you would give then to help people be more proactive with uh, noticing it or in themselves or in an organisation and then doing something about it and like taking steps forward if they feel uncomfortable? 
Yeah, I mean, I think self-aware, self-awareness is a huge thing. Recognize, for the individual. Yeah, for the individual. Recognising um, unhelpful patterns of behaviour and unhelpful thinking. So, you know, it almost feels like our brain is wired to think negatively or, or, or dwell on stuff. Yeah. And actually, we do focus a lot on the bad stuff. Having that self-awareness, we can stop those thoughts early on. Yeah. And say, well, is that fact? Is that real? And try and focus more on the positive and choose optimism rather than dwelling on the negative stuff. And, you know, choosing optimism, being positive, practicing gratitude. You know, there's also all sorts of research out there that suggests that it builds new neurological pathways to feeling happier. Yep. Um, so I think self-awareness is a, is a huge thing, you know, about those thinking patterns, identifying them early on, but also patterns of behavior. You know, in times of stress, we're probably likely to reach out for a donut than something that's um you know and that comfort food and then avocado well yeah something more nourishing so if there's any if 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 anyone's a bit like me and maybe a little bit cynical so i like when i hear things i don't always believe in them I'm like okay is that true you know something that i've you know i actually started to learn about the mind more through buddhism which if you'd have told me before that i'd have been like i'm not interested and for me i don't just hear something and what i love about buddhism is they the buddha always talks about don't just take what you're told for don't just listen to it and believe it like try it out see if it works for you mm-hmm. and two and a half thousand years ago this guy's talking about meditation to create better thoughts in your mind mm-hmm. and now only in the last five five to ten years has science proven that the concept of neuroplasticity so what you've just said has been proven by science that if you've got negative thought patterns you can, and science has proven, you can change your mind, you can change your brain at any age by consciously creating positive thought patterns. Mm-hmm. And it literally, they can show you on a scan, will change how your brain works. Yeah. So this isn't just nicey, nicey, oh, let's think more positive, you know, yeah. which is what the cynic would say and what I probably would have said. This is, this is it works, it's required, and it's proven by science. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it takes practice. Absolutely, it takes practice. Um, but you know, I practice it every night, every night before I go to bed, I think about my day and I am grateful and I practice that gratitude and yes, yeah, some research I think was published a couple of weeks ago. If we do that consistently over 21 days, actually we can start to notice the difference in feeling, that habit. And feeling happier and feeling more positive. I can't, the amount of, I do, I'm an obsessive research, personal development and health and happiness and the amount of successful people that i've read about when i talk about successful people i'm talking about in all areas of life not just having loads of money people that do what they love and make money and have a great lifestyle they the amount of them that journal has always stood out to me they write down their thoughts at the end of the day you know from your richard branson's to 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 all of the all of these inspirational people they journal and they talk about how it helps them be appreciative of what they've got and and get their thoughts out of their mind Mm. yeah and I think that also goes for, you know, some, t- you know, this year in particular, some days I've woken up and it's just been, oh God. And I've just had one of those days where, I was woke- where I've woken up, no reason for it, but I feel low. And I've tried to work in the morning and actually t- at 11 o'clock I'm feeling exhausted and it's not a good day. And just, I think the art of being kind to yourself as well. So often we're beating ourselves up and, oh, I'm not going to get this done today. Actually, if you're having a bad day, that's okay as well we're not always going to wake up and and you know be an eight out of ten when it comes to our mental health actually for no reason at all you know i've noticed this year sometimes my mental health's gone gone down to a four or five out of ten no reason for it but then actually just applying self-compassion and saying it's okay sally it's okay to have a bad day it's only today it's temporary and tomorrow will be a better day and having that element of acceptance rather than oh i'm not going to get this done and what's wrong with you and you know, practicing talking to yourself as you would a friend. If your friend said, oh, I, you know, I've, uh, I've had a, I've felt low today, I've had a bad day. You know, if you're a good friend, you wouldn't be saying, well, what's wrong with you? Just pull yourself together. Those are the things that we wouldn't be saying to a friend, but it's what we say to ourselves. So, so it's a lot of that this year as well. So when you're having negative self-talk, step, try to consciously step out of yourself and talk to yourself from the third party. Yeah and just have a more positive it's okay would you something you said then that i think is really powerful is when you're talking to yourself like that like almost imagine you're saying it out loud and would you talk to your friend like that and if the answer is no stop doing it yeah or recognize it and start telling yourself off yeah you talked about a scale of one to ten is that something that you use then like you have you got a conscious one to ten scale and you're like today I've, I'm, I'm a ten today i'm a one or are you aware of that is that something that you teach and use 
Yeah, so so sometimes I'm, it's not my scale. So there's a chap called Rob Stevenson, uh, jo, uh, Rob Stevenson, who's created this form score. Yep. Um, and he talks about form rather than mental health because again, there's so much negative connotation with that phrase, mental health. So he talks about form, and it's a form score. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're connected on LinkedIn, and he's using it all the time, and I actually use it quite a lot. And when I'm delivering my online mental health first aid courses. I send out a pre-course questionnaire and I ask people on a scale of one to 10, where would you say your mental health is at? Because of course, you know, delivering these courses online, I want to make sure that everyone feels safe and I've got a kind of understanding of where people might be. Yeah. Um, it's such a fantastic, easy to use resource. I'd recommend anyone, anyone use it and you know, you can download it. Organizations are using it. It's fantastic. Okay. Very good. So we, should we reference that below the post? Yeah. Yeah. What was it called? Form score. Form score. Um, Rob Stevenson. So if somebody was listening and they're from an individual perspective and they're not feeling good, so they're below a five on a regular, and that's on a regular basis, yeah. when would you say, okay, this is something you need to go and talk to somebody about? I, I would say talk as early as possible. So even before getting to a four or five, if you know, you, you, you're normally an eight and then it's gone down to a seven, then maybe to a six, communication having that social connection talk as early on about your feelings you know if it's work related talk about your workloads having that open and honest conversation you know i'm actually losing sleep because i'm worried about this deadline before it becomes so serious that it's a mental health issue if we can have those conversations earlier on yep. and be open about that the better it is and that's something really striking that you said you said that if you you know you, your story is you led from this high level career to, to depression mm. and to burnout but you said and this something really stood out to me if I'd have talked that wouldn't have happened yeah I really truly believe that and naturally I've never been one to talk about my feelings I always bottled things up absorbed other people's emotions never really had arguments but I truly believe had I talked about it early on and again there's so much research that says that mental health issues start with stress long-term stress undealt with stress Actually, if I could have shared so much earlier on about how many hours I was working and how, how much pressure there was, yep. uh, then I could have got help earlier and, and I could have asked for help as well. And I think that's a key thing. Talk about your feelings, but also ask for help. So you said that the employer at the time when you did speak to them were absolutely amazing. Your line manager looked after you and they couldn't have been any better and you loved the company. So what they were clearly a good, a good company to work for. And the reason you weren't talking wasn't through necessarily because you weren't being treated nicely so what could that employer have done to make sally feel more open to discussing this issue before it came an issue or was it purely that sally didn't know she needed to do it so it's probably an element of both of those things so at the time i kind of just thought i was being overly sensitive again lots of self-stigma so just what's wrong with you Stop yeah there definitely needs to be an education piece for sally yeah so a bit of education just a lack of insight that actually I was unwell because I'd never envisaged that I would become unwell in that way. Yeah. So I think there was that. And sometimes when you are unwell, you can't see when you're in the eye of the storm, you can't see it. And yeah. that's where some of these training programs that I deliver come in when someone from the outside can look in and say, what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I think just generally did the organization talk about mental health in general? Probably not. So I wasn't sure if it was safe to actually talk about it anyway too so i think yeah. it's an element of both of those so things. even though they were good at it and it was handled very well because it hadn't been talked about so um proactively yeah. you were you weren't sure that it was okay to talk about this yeah even though but, they were good at it yeah absolutely when, when i was having the conversations i was kind of like oh it is okay Oh, you know, so, I, I really like just, it. so it literally a small intervention of making sure that once every few months or a year, there's a conversation around, we, we want you to talk to us. If you have a mental health issue and it's a real thing that could have made all the difference because actually the, the system to support you was there, but you didn't know that it was. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing is, is that role in particular was regional. So I was covering a few different offices and my line manager's role was covering the whole region. So actually that face-to-face -face time could be quite sporadic. Yeah. And we'd have regular one-to-ones, absolutely. But more yeah. often than not, they'd have to be over the phone. Yeah. So there wasn't actually necessarily conversations around 
what are your working hours looking like at the moment? How are you getting on at the moment? Yeah. I'm coping okay. So I don't think those conversa conversations necessarily happened. I suppose there was an expectation of me putting my hand up and saying, I can't cope, but I naturally don't do that. And I've never done that. So do you think there, uh, you know, you said you were working however many hours you were working and you look back at it now and it's like, obviously this was not healthy. Mm. Do you think that there's a, a, a realistic way that employers could have a measurement system in place to know, and I know it's difficult to track when people are working, but just, just flag up a red flag that Sally in, in HR is working like Saturday, to, Saturday through to Monday. She's clocking up all the hours. She's not having any time off. She's not taking a break. You know, that's a red flag. Like we need to address this before it becomes an issue. Do you think there's a realistic way that employers could start being a little bit more proactive with that as well? I think you'd like to think so, but it's also down to individuals themselves as well to actually do yep. what's reasonable. And what I was doing was unreasonable. Yep. So of course, employers have a, a duty of care and a responsibility for people's mental health, but actually we as individuals also have a responsibility. Yep. And it might start to feel a bit like micromanaging in terms of you know yep. tracking hours and things like that. But yep. again, just making sure you have the time to have a welfare conversation and say, how are you doing at the moment? How how you know, not just about work and workload, but, you know, how is life at the moment? How are you finding things? You know, is there anything going on at the moment that I need to be aware of before you move on to, okay, so we do have all these projects, we do have all these deadlines, you know, are you feeling under particular pressure? How are you coping with everything? Is the balance okay? Yeah, I've just drawn up a little diagram. I'll, I'll, I'll do it post, I'll make it a bit prettier post um, conversation. But basically what I've, what I've drawn is, is that you've got, you've got, that's very good high quality there, isn't it? So you've got one end of the feed, which is the individual needs to be responsible and educated to look after themselves. Yeah. You've got the other end, which is the organization needs to have a system in place to provide support should something go wrong. But then in the middle, you've got the awareness between the two that, yes, we will support you if you do have any issues, but also, you know, like work smart. Don't try, you don't need to work. If you're working 60 hours a week, you're not working smart. You know, that shouldn't happen. And that's so if, if the organization are actively doing that, the individual's getting the right training and the right supports there. A lot of the issues that go on don't have to go on. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, this is where I start thinking about schooling and stuff and starting building that awareness and coping skills because I, I didn't really have that and I didn't proactively look for it because I guess I'd always taken my mental health for granted. Yeah. <laughs> when it went wrong, I was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah complicated <laughs> and, in, and interestingly sally like from the uh from, from what from what i do and who i talk to it's the same message because a lot of people that i work with are self-employed and they they're exactly the same as sally in her job okay yeah you're you're in a job but you're very highly driven you're, you're willing to do whatever you need to do to to do well and what that normally looks like is work too much don't know when to switch off and don't know how to balance your life and you're but you're willing to do it because you're like I'm working towards success mm -hmm. but as we both know that's that's not the way to approach it so you have to have some time management you have to have balance you have to have rules I think today yeah. balance is huge yeah. taking time for rest taking breaks you know. balance used to be so naturally built into our life you know that's we you know hunter gatherers i always go back to that but they they were balanced mm -hmm. you know they worked when they worked when it was light you know and, they, and it was active work they had their social time all the time because their work was their social mm -hmm. they had people to talk to they had their elders they had a natural you know we pay a lot of money for for therapists and mentors and and all that now but that used to be naturally built into into life yeah. Whereas now none of that balance is there. We've got complete freedom to do what we want, but which means we have to we have to have rules and we have to have a new way of going about things. Yeah, yeah, we have to have our own self discipline. I think because yeah, if we actually take a rest break for half an hour, we're more likely to be more productive in the afternoon rather than just oh, I need to get all this done, so I'm just going to work through. Yeah, um, progression. Even with me, ex fitness professional, progression doesn't look like this. It looks like this: up, down, up. Yeah. Um, but you've got to you've got to have those downs if you just keep trying to train harder and harder and harder yeah your body you, i mean that's an even more quick response because your body just stops adapting yeah so these kind of things that we're discussing you you cover in the in, in the workshops yeah so certainly yeah around self-awareness top tips on maximizing your your mental well-being so you know 
positive emotions, accepting that we're not perfect and things do go wrong. Um, you know, resilience and coping skills, you know, trying to recognise those and actually, again, sometimes we use unhelpful coping mechanisms, which is yep. completely normal, yep. but then trying to learn and practice new ones. It's like any skill that you can learn. Um, yeah, and we talk a lot about physical activity as well and how important that is for, you know, boosting and maintaining, protecting your, your mental well-being. Um, so we cover all of that. It's very much a holistic approach when it comes to talking about mental health and recovery. You know, medication works for some, but not for others. And there's evidence that says actually mild to moderate depression can be treated as effectively with moderate exercise yep. and antidepressants. Yep. Um, so, yes, it's, yeah. And yeah, medication can be helpful, like I said, but not, not for everybody. So it's thinking about the... Trying to be pro it's trying to be proactive first and then taking a whole approach and using medication as required and if a professional tells you to, but also not just relying on that, I think is, is important. It's it's yeah. hugely key. And I think so many people think, you know, when they do get to that place, I've been prescribed with antidepressants, so this pill is going to magically get me better. Yeah. And that's not the case at all. There's got to be a long term strategy around lifestyle, around, you know, counselling or therapy. Um, like I say, we're whole beings. Yeah. So you know, it might be a mental illness, but it affects us behaviorally, physically, emotionally. You know, it affects our thinking patterns. But you know, before we even get to that, if we're doing all the proactive stuff like exercising and practicing mindfulness and all those things that have such strong scientific evidence. Yeah. Then actually, we can prevent getting to that place anyway. So there's, so in summary, there's you know, especially driven hard-working professionals but anybody there's there's a increasing like risk of of work falling into poor mental health because of the environment that we live in and the way that we go go about things and the lack of education that needs to change if you let yourself be unhealthy live an unhealthy lifestyle for too long regardless of whether that's in the pursuit of professional success or whatever it might be it's probably going to lead to mental health negative mental health issues but there's lots you can do about it. There's lots of preventative you can do about it, which is better and um, more effective in the in, in the long term. But there's also a lot of help there for if it has become an issue. And I think one of the biggest things we've taken is that employers need to be aware of it and address it as much as possible to make sure it doesn't become an issue that needs leads to poor people and losing their staff and overall and their overall business performance. But those individuals need to be educated and and responsible for it as well mm -hmm. and there's loads of stuff available you, you and I and lots of other so many services now to help people implement this so if it's something that you struggle with as an individual or it's something you'd like to be more proactive with with an organization try not to just deal on uh, with it on your own speak to somebody like Sally who's who's a HR previous HR professional who's got like direct experience of it so there's loads available yeah and don't go about it on your own indeed well, we were supposed to talk for 30 minutes. We've done almost an hour. Oh. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank it's you. Great. I'm uh, looking forward to putting it out. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Sally. You too. Thank Bye. you. Bye.